Welcome back to Auto Technic. Over the next couple weeks, I'm gonna be reassembling this 396 big block Chevy. And I was thinking that I'll just create a video and really not a video about reassembling the engine as much as about lesser known tips and tricks on assembling the big block Chevy. But some of the stuff will apply to almost any domestic V8. Um, there's a lot of really good info out there with tips and tricks on putting together any engines but there's quite a few of them that I feel are not talked about as much and not as known. And I feel that they're very, very important for everyone to know because none of these are really outside the scope of any home hobbyist. So this is what I think I'm gonna do when I'm putting this engine together. I'll stop at certain points and just grab the camera and walk you guys through some of the tips and tricks and things that I feel should be more common knowledge out there and walk you guys through the process and I'll share with you what I know. All right, let's talk about a couple things for block prep and oiling modifications before we really get going on this. Now, pretty common knowledge, but most people I think overlook it and that's deburring all the edges. So I take a nice little die grinder and I hit all these edges to get the sharp edges off all the way through the block. And I even go as far as to do it here in the bearing saddles where the bearing sits and up here on these corners. And I, I'll hit it with a die grinder real quick and then come back with a hand file and clean it up. And that really just helps everything sit in there true and gets rid of the sharp edges. And it also makes it a lot nicer when you're working in here with your hands. Um, one other thing that isn't talked about very much is on the bearings, you should deburr those as well. So on the back side and even up on this side right here, I had to take a small file because it had a sharp edge. And we don't want any of that to interfere with our clearances. So I file that down I clean up the burrs, and then once I get the bearings clean again, I go ahead and put a light coat of ATF on the back, and that will help them slide in and not scratch up and mar up the back side of the bearing. Another one that's not talked about enough is modifications to the rear main bearing for the thrust surface. So the thrust surface here only really gets splash lubrication, and you can see here where we have our main oil supply in this channel that comes up in this bearing half. So I went, and if you look carefully, I have filed a line right here on this rear half, and that's gonna allow pressurized oil to leak past and come back here to the back side of the bearing to help lubricate the thrust surface. So on a mild street build, you shouldn't really have to worry about too much with um, crankshaft thrust wear. That gets into issues if you're running you know, more power or a trans brake and you have a converter that's starting the balloon or clutch alignment issues or if I've experienced in the past with a PTO drive shaft in a boat, that caused thrust bearing issues. So this right here, it's a quick little easy thing you can do. You're not gonna lose much oil pressure. And if you actually dig around on the internet deep enough, you'll find that a lot of bearing manufacturers actually recommend that. Why they don't give you the bearing that way, I'm not sure. Now, while we have the die grinder out, when we're cleaning the block up, you should just go ahead and take a couple minutes and clean up this opening in the oil um, filter location. Just knock the high corners off and also spend some time on your rear main bearing cap and where the oil pump bolts on, you really want to get rid of that uh, sharp edges on this opening and smooth them up and round them out. And it doesn't have to be terribly pretty, but you just want to kind of help the oil flow in. Uh, Anything that creates, creates a restriction or turbulence can foam the oil, can lower oil pressure, can cause the oil to get hotter than we want. So just a little bit of time there. You know, it only took me 10 minutes to get that cleaned up. And one more thing that I do for the oiling, which some stock big blocks have, is on the oil galley plugs here, I have one, it's not in yet, is you go ahead and drill this with like a 20 thousandths hole. And is what that's gonna allow is oil pressure coming out of the oil galley for the lifters to go ahead and spray on the timing chain and timing chain gear. Cause if you look here, you can see where the timing gear set has been kind of rubbing on the block. And that's one thing to keep an eye of on big block Chevys is that's a wear point where that can They actually wear. have special timing chain sets you can buy to help with this issue. Either you'll have to have the block machine to accept it or the cam gear has been machined to accept it and it'll have a trunnion roller bearing here or a set of um, shims or spacers so that way it doesn't wear into the block or is to correct your block if it has too much wear. So those are the oiling modifications.
All right, so you can see I have the bare block. I've already set up my bearing clearances and <clears throat> I have the main bearings in. Now, what I usually see is most people from here go ahead and put in the rotating assembly, but this is where I deviate and I don't see many people that do this. The first thing I install in my engine is the camshaft. And the reason why I do so is with the rotating assembly out and the engine upside down, I can feed the cam in through the front and I can actually get my hand in to the cam um, tunnel and I can help guide the other end of the camshaft in so it's not so awkward and I'm not hitting and damaging the cam bearings. Uh, once you install a crankshaft, you lose all your access in here and the camshaft has no effect on the crankshaft or installing anything else. So on this really applies to any domestic V8, big block, small block, um, Ford Mopar. I always do the cam first. It's the first thing I do. All right, let's take a minute and talk about bearing clearances and how to measure them. Now, like most home hobbyists, when I first started building engines, plastic gauge is what I used. I've used it on several engines and have never had any issues with it. But through the years, I've acquired more equipment and tried to continue growing my skills. So that is not what I use anymore. I use typical measuring equipment to measure it, but I use it in a little bit of a different way. And that's because when I'm using a, a C mic here, and let's say I'm measuring my crankshaft journal diameter. Well, then if I were to take a dial bore gauge and measure the bearing housing or even the bearing shell in the housing, I'm essentially using two tools and doing math to make a measurement, but it doesn't take into account if there's an error on one tool. You're assuming that they're both perfectly calibrated and that there's no discrepancies. And there's an actually easier way to do that. And is what I'll do is I'll go ahead and place all my bearing shells in the saddles. I'll install all my caps and torque them to spec. I'll take my standard C mic and I'll measure the outside diameter of the crankshaft journal. So if I'm gonna measure the number one bearing here, I'll measure and set the mic to the number one journal and lock it down. Then is what I'll do is I'll take that mic and set it in a bench vise and I use it as a standard to calibrate my dial bore gauge. So I'll put this inside that C mic, I'll zero the dial bore gauge, and then I come back and measure the bearing in the housing and the dial bore gauge will show me the exact bearing clearance that I have. This way I can use two tools, but I'm only using the C mic essentially as an adjustable standard. I'm using the dial bore gauge to make all my measurements and I'm consistent. There's no math to do. Very easy way to go about it, and you can buy inexpensive C mics and dial board gauge kits for under 100 bucks and start practicing and getting experience with doing your measurements that way. Now, there's another thing that when you're doing the measurements, if you have one housing that's tight, in the past I've always gone and if I have one that's tight, I would take the bearing shells out and swap them to the housing that's loose and kind of mix and match to try to even out my tolerances. More recently, I've gone ahead and ordered a new micrometer, and if you see, it has this ball on the end. And that way, I can go ahead and use this to measure the thickness of the bearing shell. So if I have, let's say, one bore or bearing that's tight and one that's loose, I can pop out my shells and I can measure the bearings, and sometimes you'll see enough of a difference so I can make a calculated guess on adjusting to the tolerance I need and I don't have to just play musical shells until I hopefully get it right. So that having that extra micrometer does cut down on setting the clearances. Now I got the crank in and I have the rear main cap off and that's because there's a couple more things I wanted to show you here. One thing on the rear main seal, don't set it flush with the block. You can see that I have it offset about a half to three quarter of a quarters of an inch. And that's purpose is to keep the parting line of that seal separate from the parting line of the block. And that's gonna go ahead and help prevent that from leaking. I also put a little bit of silicone on the edges of the seal. And also right here where the cap sits, the seal it off because oil can wick through there and the oil pan gasket and oil pan won't seal that up. Now, now with putting sealant here underneath the main cap, I'm very moderate on how much I put on. And when I put the main cap on and torque it, it will push it out and it won't cause any clearance issues of the main cap to set up and I'll clean off the excess. It's just a very minimal, minimal amount to go on there. Like I
All right, you can see I have it up to a short block now, and I got several things that I wanted to cover at this point, so we'll just go ahead and get into it. Um, one of the things that I didn't cover, which is an earlier step, which is on block prep, and when I'm cleaning out the bores, especially after it's been honed like this, I wash this block twice, and then I go back and clean back the, the bores with ATF. Now, ATF has a lot of detergents in it, and it's really good at cleaning things, so if you've ever noticed when you're working on um, your transmission or anything with ATF that your hands get clean, your tools all of a sudden are clean, that's the ATF that does that. So if you take a white paper towel and you wipe the ATF, soak it in ATF, and then you rub out the cylinder bores, you can rub it and you can keep track of how clean your bores are because it's going to keep staining your white rag with the metal from the honing. So even after washing this twice and then going through it with the rag and ATF, I still pulled quite a bit out. Um, I didn't use a white rag. I was using this blue shop towel. Don't mind that dirty, the two stains here because I used it for other things, but the main part of it around the sides, you can see that that was um, metal coming out of the bores from after the honing. So that's one thing. Uh, another one that I didn't cover is the pistons. Take the time to knock down any sharp edges on the pistons and combustion chambers. You want to do that so that way you don't have any sharp spots which create hot spots which can help. I usually take just a Dremel and go ahead and hit the edges and sometimes I'll just go over it with a hand sandpaper like some 600 grit to smooth it out and clean it up. So that's another tip that you should definitely do on all of your pistons. Um, just get them nice and smooth. Nice flowing corners. Get rid of any sharp edges. Uh, another thing that I've done on this and this one really applies to big block Chevys and 396s as I got pretty aggressive on the block eyebrows here. You can see that I've gone and gone out and matched the shape of the combustion chamber and went down to the stop right before the first ring. I'm going to go ahead and make a whole nother video on this subject because there's a little bit more to it than that. But that's one thing to pay attention to when you're building these engines. Now, these pistons here are kind of like your basic rebuilder. They advertise them as 10 to 1 pistons, and the first time I had this engine apart, I measured the piston to deck clearance, and what most people don't know on these rebuilder type pistons, that they purposely drop the um, wrist pin height on these pistons down 20 thousandths, and they do that to help accommodate for, you know, everyone's tolerances when they're doing these rebuilds, so they're not necessarily a, a super performance oriented piston where they want everything as tight as possible. So when I pulled this apart the first time to refresh it, my pistons were like a hundred thousandths down in the bore, counting for the head gasket and for the thick, the change of the piston. So as what I did is this block actually I had deck twenty thousandths and then I run um, the head gasket that I'm running and I'm looking for a quench area of about thirty five to forty thousandths. Now if you have too much quench area, again that's another thing that will help promote detonation and pre-ignition and it really hurts the efficiency of your combustion chamber so that's one thing to keep in mind that when you're assembling these engines you need to check that height and i was i happened to do so on beforehand to get the block decked and you can see now this is the lowest one it's at 14 thousandths the rest of them are you know one two one thousandths two thousandths five thousandths and on this bank they're all quite a bit closer and those tolerances of the ones that are a little bit deeper in the hole, um, I attribute those either a tolerance or a difference in the stock rod or these pistons. I'm not going to chase it on this build. If I had a higher end build where I was using a nicer forged piston or a aftermarket rod, I would expect these to be a little bit closer to each other. But considering this is kind of a mild or a stock rebuild, it's good enough for what we have. And I'll be running a head gasket that I... I think I'm running a 40 thousandths compressed thickness gasket on this, so I'll have the quench area that I need. Now, speaking of head gaskets, there's something else what I want to go over here. And when you have your head gasket, one thing to pay attention to is when you're ordering it is your diameter of this opening here. You can see that I actually have, you know, eighth of an inch overhang over my deck surface. Now, it was a compromise for this build on getting the right diameter gasket and thickness and also the cost of the gasket that I was doing. But that's one thing that if you're not careful, a lot of these gaskets are made for 4.5 inch bores or bigger. And if you're running a smaller bore engine like I have, you're actually just really hurting your compression. And again, if this, if 
in a combination with your quench area, if you have too much quench area, and then also you have too big of a diameter of gasket, again, you're really hurting the efficiency of your combustion chamber, and you're just kind of asking for problems with pre-ignition and detonation. So spend a little bit of time in the catalog and size out your gaskets. Uh, so another tip that I had is I used to always use these reed compressors to install my pistons and whenever you guys are building an engine, spend the $50. These adjustable tapered piston reed compressors, it's not worth it on trying to fight the pistons in. I found that these ones sometimes will drop into the bore with the piston. I've broken rings with these before. Not such a big deal on this old domestic V8 with a bigger, thicker ring, but on the, if you have a more modern piston and ring package, you're gonna be running a lot thinner of a ring. And this is where these compressors just don't work. So I've never broken a ring with this style of compressor. Invest in those. Before I throw the oil pan on and button up the bottom end, one more thing that I usually do that I don't see a lot of people do or talk about, and that's right here on the oil pump mating surface and for the oil filter housing adapter. Much like the main cap, I seal that up with sealant, and you can see that I put just a minimal amount in there where it barely leaks out. And the reason why I do that is so once the oil is pressurized through the pump, I'm not losing any um, oil pressure and have any oil loss out of here where that could, not as much on the pressure side, could cause some aeration. On the suction side, it certainly can. And same thing with the filter. I basically want to keep the oil within all the oil passages and oil galleys and not let it leak out. So when I see guys do other builds, that's just another detail I don't see. Obviously, like I mentioned about aeration and the oil, I fully weld on the oil um, suction tube to the housing for that simple reason right there. One, I don't want it coming out, but two, I don't want to aerate my oil by sucking in some air there. So I seal it up and hold it in with that. So. Okay, we got the engine up upright again, and I'm gonna go over the last couple things that I wanted to talk about. Now this one right here that I'm gonna talk about is specific to a big block Chevy, and it's specific to the factory iron heads. It's not really commonly talked about, but these factory iron heads are limited on possible valve lift due to the valve guides. So usually you won't find many factory replacement style cams that run more than 550 thousandths lift. And that's because you're gonna run the retainer and keeper into the guide. And you just don't have enough room for that much valve movement. Now also on top of the factory heads, either if you are running valve seals, you're running like an umbrella valve seal or if you've had a head that's been upgraded at some point, they make these, um, this is like an older style upgrade, which is a rubber seal with a Teflon ring that fits over the factory guide. Now, neither of these are really that ideal. And, you know, today running a nice Viton seal is a lot better, but you can't really find these Viton seals that fit over the factory valve guides very well, and you still have your lift issue. So you can buy these Arbors and Pilots and that go ahead, goes ahead and slides into your valve guide and you're able just to use a hand drill or a drill press or whatever you have available. And not only will this cut down the outside diameter of your valve guide, it'll cut down the total height. So is what this is gonna let you do is it's gonna let you run a better Viton valve seal that's smaller in diameter so you can run a bigger spring package, but it's also gonna allow you to have more lift with the factory heads and the factory guides. So that is definitely one thing to keep an eye on. Those cutters are pretty inexpensive. They're about under $100. So when you're building an engine, depending on your cam selection, it is worth it to invest in that. Now, the last thing that I wanted to cover on this is stabbing the distributor and setting up your initial timing. Now, everything you read and see, they always recommend put it on top dead center, cylinder one on compression, and then they usually have you stab the distributor and line up the rotor with the cylinder number one. Now, I found that when I used to do it that method, I would eventually, <clears throat> when I'd fire the engine up, I'd have to make a pretty big change on timing, which depending on your application would change the spark plug wire routing that you already done. And the car didn't fire well, you had to change the routing and you just ended up putting a lot more advance in the engine because you're starting on top dead center. So as what I started doing a couple of years ago is I actually will rotate the engine over and right here you can see if it shows up, I'm about 20 degrees before top dead center. And I'll go ahead and do that and 
depending on what the base timing of the engine is, will decide how far I go. But I'll do the same thing that everyone recommends with the exception that I give it some built-in advance right now. So right now, I have about 20 degrees of advance in the engine. So if I stab the distributor, put the rotor at number one, and run my wires, when I fire this engine up, not only is it going to fire up better and quicker because I have the advance built in, I've taken it into account, and the timing is closer to what it will be when it's running, but also I don't have to make any drastic changes rotating my distributor, and the spark plug wire routing stays cleaner in the end. So that's just another one that I started doing over the years, and I've always had really good success with it. It's worked out really well. So that's going to go ahead and cover it for this video. Um, on this engine assembly, those are the tips and tricks that I felt were worth discussing that aren't talked about enough. If you guys have some that I didn't discuss that aren't in this video, please put them below in the comments. I really want to hear what you guys have to say and also share this knowledge with everyone so it's a little bit more common because a lot of this stuff isn't really advanced and I think it needs to be out there. It needs to be discuss discussed more. So anyways, that wraps up this build. I'm done with that. So if you guys like the video, please comment, like, subscribe, and take a minute and check out the other videos on my channel. Appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you.